Hi, everybody, and welcome to Wasawa's uh, webinar series. So today, we're going to talk about top tips for impactful consultation. I'm Dr. Natasha Lee, and I'm the chair of the Animal Welfare and Wellness Committee. So our committee is bringing this webinar to you, and we are partnered by the Purina Institute, who is Wasawa's diamond partner. And today, we have an, a very exciting speaker, Suzanne Rogers, who is also my personal friend here. Um, she is going to talk about giving you the tips on impactful consultations based on her knowledge on human behavior change. So if you don't know, uh, look at the bottom left screen, HBCA. That is Human Behavior Change for Animals. It's her organization that she co-founded uh, that started in 2016. Um, because, I mean, Suzanne has a long history of working with, with animal welfare projects. And if you look at all the causes of animal welfare issues, it, a lot of it boils down to human behavior. And how do you change and make a very impact on animal welfare? That is, you need to change human behavior, not necessarily animal behavior, but human behavior uh, is usually one of the causes for animal welfare issues. So today she's going to focus on our vet veterinary clinics, how you can incorporate the knowledge of human behavior change for animals and make your consultation as impactful as possible. So without further ado, let's invite Suze to uh, introduce herself again and, and start her presentations. Thank you, Nat, and thank you for Wasaba for having me as well. So today I'd like to try to be a little bit interactive to keep you all awake. Um, so if you do have access to a pen and paper, that would be great. Or you could keep it in your head or type it on your computer. Um, and do feel free to use the chat as well, um, because we'll be able to see that. So to keep you awake, ideally, we will have some interaction and we'd love to hear from you and some of your examples. So as Nat uh, introduced me, um, I exactly what she said, it was from working with animal behaviour and realising that it's not really about the animals, it's always about the humans, that I became more and more interested in the human element of animal welfare, animal protection and, and wider. And that led me to a little stop tour of thinking about human psychology and all sorts of other fields that input into this fascinating area um, all towards hoping to make the world a better place for animals. So why should we understand human behaviour? We like animals. Um, as Nat said, human behaviour is the root cause of most animal suffering and in the context of veterinary work it can help us to understand um, why maybe we're struggling with compliance. It can help our communication and our consultations be more efficient. And rapport is so important. When we're working with clients, we need to have rapport so that they trust us and that they're likely to do what we ask them to do to help that animal. And we spend a lot of time, or I spend a lot of time, thinking about animal behaviour. But humans are animals too, and we're sometimes prone to the same behavioural um, concepts and the same things influence our behaviour, just like they do for animals. And there's a really um, pertinent quote from Karen Overall from her 2013 book. She's an animal, a veterinary behaviourist, and she said that with, with regards to success of treatment, client compliance may be the most critical factor. So it's not so much about the diagnosis, because what does that mean if the person can't support the animal in the changes or the medication they need? It's there's lots riding on the human behaviour. And also, um, we know from the human health sector that studies looking at change where lifestyle changes are necessarily longer term find only about a 25% compliance. So that's quite depressing because if people can't even change their behaviour to help themselves and their own health, we're expecting them to change some of the things they do for the benefit of that animal. And so it, we're, you know, we've got a bit of a struggle here and we need to learn as much as we can to try to improve that compliance and the effectiveness of our work. So before we go too much further, I'd just like you to grab your trusty pen and paper 
um, or feel free to type things in the chat as well. And if you're watching this on record, you can pause this and, and do it even more properly. <laughs> um, so just think about what behavior of your own behavior have you tried to change? So have you tried to eat less, exercise more, stop smoking, something like that? What have you tried to change about yourself? Feel free to share any examples or to keep it down. Exercise more is definitely one of the, the things for me. <clears throat> and with the lockdown, it's it's definitely a challenge. <laughs> I think I exercised more and ate more in the um, lockdown. So it kind of evened itself out. <laughs> um, so and then do you have the knowledge to make that change? So really thinking about um, if you wanted to exercise more, do you know what you need to do? What's good exercise? What would suit you? How to do it safely? And, and all that kind of stuff. Is knowledge a barrier or do you have the knowledge you need to make the change? Take a moment to reflect on that. In true British form, I have a cup of tea with me, so I'm gonna have a <laughs> have a sip. <laughs> we do like tea here. And then, current continuing, did you have do you have a reason? What's your motivation for wanting to make this change? Um, do you want to just be healthier, or do you, are you aiming to be able to fit into something that you want to wear on holiday? So, do you know the benefits of why you want to change? I think it's jealousy mostly for me. When you see when you see a lot of videos of people very fit and doing a lot of stuff, I was like, I think I can do that as well. Maybe change the videos you watch. <laughs> no, no, that's bad. Then yes, that's that's a good that can be a good motivation, that peer pressure or this peer support and motivational element. Oh yeah. A lot of my friends are also sharing their exercise routines on Facebook and all social media as well. So that that <laughs> Pushes yes, me as well. Drama and tech, and you can compete with how many steps you've taken a day, or cheat by waving your Fitbit about. Um, so you're thinking about that um, now. Thinking about this behaviour that you've been trying to change, have you changed? Um, are you completely reformed? Are you doing it more? Did you find it easy? Um, and if you have changed something about your behaviour and it's worked for you, why do you think it was easy? What was the key thing that made that real difference? And at the same time, if you're dealing with a behavior that you haven't really changed, what do you think is the key barrier as to what stopped you? So yeah, Nat, picking on you. <laughs> How easy are you finding exercising more? So I realized that I, I, I like exercise when I'm doing it, doing it with friends and maybe a group of people. Uh, maybe having a, a coach that's leading leading on to so a group exercise kind of thing. But with the lockdown and I'm alone and only have YouTube videos on, on how to do things, I, I find that I just, I'm just watching it rather than doing it. So uh, for me, my motivation is people. So I think many of us have tried to change something about our behaviour in the past. Um, some things we might have changed quite well and other things are still very much a work in progress. So, but the thing I wanted to encourage you to think about from these questions is that it's so easy to assume as vets and as people working in animal welfare, that all we need to do is explain to people, give them the knowledge about what's needed to change their behavior and explore with them why they should do it um, and focus on that element. But we know from ourselves that we can really want to do something. We know the knowledge. We, we know what's needed to do it. And it still doesn't happen that it's, there's more going on. There's more to it. And if we focus on trying to give people knowledge and explaining things to people, then maybe we're not going to necessarily be successful in changing their behavior. So that goes for our clients. If we're trying to encourage them to feed their dog in a different way or take more exercise with their dog, for example, um, they're, they're probably going to need something else, not just knowing that they should do it. And continue on just 
thinking a little bit about this like this sort of thing Con and continuing on your piece of paper or do feel free to put anything in the chat as well um have other people tried to make you change have you have you experienced having maybe family or someone saying that you should change something about yourself so for me everybody sees that i'm always awake at silly times of night because i'm on email and things like that and they say you need to get more sleep you should get more sleep it's really important um but that doesn't make me think i've got to get more sleep that makes me annoyed that they haven't realized the way I work how I am how I'm a nocturnal person and that, that's just I'm never going to be an early bird and get up happily leaping out of bed singing songs in the morning I'm a I'm a night owl I work better at night I'm cleverer at night and I don't want people to tell me to get more sleep um they don't know that I don't sleep you know they don't know what time I get up and so for me um people trying to change me makes me feel defensive it might make me feel a bit angry it makes me feel not listened to um, so that's just an example, but what's an example for you? How do you feel when people try to make you change? I think I have the same story as well. So I'm, I myself am an, an a night owl as well. And this, this started when I was teenage, uh, in my teenage years as well. And I remember studying at night or maybe reading a book late at night. And my grandmother would suddenly open my room, room door and ask me to go to sleep. And instead of actually sleeping early, like what she advises, what I did was I bought a, a door lock <laughs> to lock my door so that she can't open it anymore. <laughs> so it you're changing change her behavior, not the other way around. <laughs> that definitely stopped the problem, though. <laughs> That's so funny. So I think we've probably all experienced this in, in some way. We've all experienced someone trying to change our behavior. And it's really good to reflect on this because ultimately when we're in a consultation with someone, often we are trying to get them to change their behavior. And what we don't want is them to start locking you out, either metaphorically or realistically or in, in real life. Um, and we don't want to create that defense and those barriers come up. So how can we avoid doing that when we're ultimately trying to change people? Okay. So now just getting a little bit more into sort of evidence-based science of it before we come up with some top tips. So human behavior change or HBC, it, we can learn so much from so many fields that's relevant. So we've got like social science, behavioral economics, things like counseling. Um, we've got lots of ologies, sociology, anthropology, physio, uh, psychology, um, and so on. We've got things like education and social marketing, and participatory approaches, and also the science of human behavior change, um, sometimes in its own right, or sometimes drawing on all these things. And so it's not just a, like, how do we change human behavior? You just need this magical um, injection. Um, we can draw from all these fields that have been changing behavior for centuries, especially things like marketing. You know, people who work in marketing or who work in management, they're, they're you know, often successfully all the time, living and breathing, changing people's behavior. There's so much out there that we can apply to animal welfare and animal health. At HBCA, we try to think about things in stages. Um, so first of all, whether it's a project, whether we're designing a campaign or just having a conversation with somebody, um, we try to, first of all, really understand what the context is. It's so easy to make assumptions about why people are doing things or not doing things and then give advice and information based on those assumptions. But if we take a step back and really understand where they're coming from, what their issues are, what barriers there are, what barriers there might be, and the motivation for things, and then we're much more likely to put a better plan in place. And that leads to the change element, to helping them change and supporting them through the change and realizing what shortcuts we can make. How can we make the change as easy and smooth as possible? And then from that, of course, it's really important not to just change and hope for the best, but to measure the impact. So are we really, is it is the change sustainable? Um, has it lasted, is it short term and you just need someone to feed their animal a course of antibiotics and then that's fine and you don't need any more? Um, but what is it impactful? Have you made an effective change that's doing the job? And at the side, I always turn my head, um, at the side we've got the monitoring and um, research and development. That shows that at each level we're always going back. Is it working? What's happening? How's this information being taken? 
have we still got a good rapport with the other person? And so the real top tip in this is so basic, but so important, is that before we start really moving on to how we're going to change people, we need to make sure that we understand first, because this will tailor the way we talk to people and make ultimately the communication more effective. And related to this, human behavior change requires a systems-based approach. So behavior doesn't interact, doesn't, isn't on its own. You don't do things, there's all sorts of other influences. So, you know, you're all vets just in the way that we have a respiratory system and a circulatory system and a lymphatic system and so on. And it all works together to make us who we are and lots of things are related. It's the same with behaviors. There's lots of influences and each single behavior is part of a much bigger system. So we need to be careful sometimes that when we're um, trying to change something, we've, we've really understood the context that that's working in because the barrier might be the context that might not be just that behavior. So we like to think about a systems-based approach. And we use this slide because of course, coronavirus is a system as well. If you, if you solve it on one small island, although Britain aren't doing that well at solving it, but if you solve it on one small island, um, you've still got trade, you've still got flights, you know, the, it works as a whole and we need to work as a system. So in throughout, the, I'm aware that we've all been a lot of time on the computer. So I just want to include a stretch break. So if you're sitting down, have a stretch, wiggle your shoulders. Um, if you're standing up, touch your toes a couple of times and feel free to do that. I can't see all of you, I can see Nat. If I can see you or not, <laughs> feel free to do this because it's important to keep moving. So um, at HBCA, we have, we kind of, there's this massive field. There's so much to learn and there's so many things we can pull on. You get really excited and then you get a bit daunted with how are we going to break this down into being relevant for us and our work. And so we've put it into four key principles of human behavior change. The first is that change is a process and we'll come to each of these in a minute. The second is that understanding psychology is key. The third is the effect of the environment. And the fourth is that change has to be owned. Um, and especially as vets, we're not living with the animal every day. We can't physically administer the antibiotics or rebandage or whatever's needed. We, we need to make sure that the owners of the animals are doing those things. And these principles are relevant whether you're talking about individuals or if you're talking about communities or even society. So it's also relevant to some of the outreach work that some of you might do in your communities. So in terms of the first one, change is a process. So we don't tend to, sometimes if something really, really drastic happens, we change overnight and we're doing something one day and then we never do it again. But most of the time it's a little bit more subtle than that. So there's more stages and we'll come to that in a minute. And also there's so much science of this. I think in the animal world, we often think we have to reinvent things, but there's so much out there in terms of human health and the environment. And there's so many people studying change as a process that we can learn from that. One that's such evidence-based model is this one on the top right, um, the behavior change wheel. So first of all, this looks at understanding, that's the green bit. So understanding the behavior and how it relates to those elements of capability, opportunity and motivation. And if we explore those, and then we'll have a really good understanding of what's driving the behavior, the reasons behind it, the barriers and the opportunities. And then the red uh, circle, um, that's about intervention function. So once we've got a really good grasp of what's going on, we can then plan different interventions. And this model was created from a review of thousands and thousands of evidence of changes that have happened and evidences of how it got there. And so they put it together. It was work done by the University of London or UCL um, and has been applied in many areas since then. And then the gray circle around the edge is the policy category. So this is how it can get wider and go from beyond individual change to societal change. So this is a really good tool. And um, there's a book called The Behaviour Change Wheel. And that is The Behaviour Change Wheel. Um, it takes you step by step. So if you're really going to be geeky about it um, and you want to kind of do it in a scientific way, and then it's a really good tool to use. But there's plenty of things we can learn from it um, at the top tips level as well. And one model that's part of this um, behavior change wheel and understanding it is the stages of change model. So this is where we get um, a bit more relevant to you guys. 
So people, as they work through an issue, we have this stages of change. Whereas first, first of all, there's pre-contemplation. So that's when you don't really, it's not on your radar. You're not, so let's take um, maybe pet obesity. So for example, you've got a very large cat, um, but you don't think of them as being obese. You're not thinking about the health risks to that. Um, you just, you know, living with your cat. <laughs> um, and that's where some people will be. The second part is contemplation. So you'll start thinking, maybe my cat's a lot bigger than other cats. It doesn't fit through the standard cat flap or something. And um, there must be something going on. I'm going to start thinking, I'm thinking in a different way about my pet and maybe I need to do something. So some of our clients will be in that stage. The next stage is preparation. So this is when they start maybe looking at Google, sometimes dangerous, um, looking at, um, you know, booking a vet or a vet nurse appointment, asking their friends. They're sort of preparing for knowing a bit more um, and maybe doing something. Then the next phase is action. So this is when maybe they're putting the cat on a diet. They've, they've made the appointment. They've got some advice. They're looking at exercise and diet and that kind of thing. And the next stage is maintenance. So this is when, you know, you don't have to just do something once, but you need to keep going. And throughout any of these stages, you can have, um, you can relapse. So you can go back into any stage at all. And the tip here, the really key, the sort of beauty of this is that when you're working with clients, if you get your communication right, and then you can help them through this process. But many times we're slightly off kilter with what the client needs. So for example, if we go in in a, com in a consultation, they've just come in for maybe vaccinations or something, and you notice that their animal's obese, you leap in with lots of actions and you say, your animal's obese, they need to change the diet, you need to do the exercise. And if the person is at the pre-contemplation stage, this, they're not gonna um, gel with this. They're not gonna feel rapport with you. Um, they go, I'm just gonna get my charger. Um, they're not, they're gonna um, not feel totally engaged with what you're saying because it's all a bit of a shock to them. You've come in at the action stage, um, but they're, they're not there yet. And so for that person, what they really need is uh, more open questions. You know, have you, have you thought about your cat's weight? Have you had any problems? Have you got any worries about their, about their health? And you might be a bit more of a gentle introduction. However, the other way, if the person's ready for action and they want to advice on how to change their animal's diet, for example, and you go in with all the reasons and um, the justification for it and ask them lots of questions, and then they're going to be frustrated because they're going to be, I know all this, I just want to know what to do. And so this is a really useful model to be able to just in your head, visualize and think when you're having a conversation, where, where is this person in this process and how can I best meet their needs because that will lead to a more effective efficient consultation that is ultimately more productive so um, i just want to pause then and see if you want to share or or think about that in other ways as well and just one more thing is that this works obviously at the individual level as i've just explained it but also it works wider so you could have um, for example introducing a new law so with policy you could be for whole community if um, the, the, the country is at the state of pre-contemplation and then they don't even know there's a need and then you introduce a law, there's going to be not much, um, uh, come, uh, they're not going to obey the law um, and you're going to have to need a lot more enforcement than if you've taken people through a process and they're ready for that law to be announced. So in the UK, when the smoke, anti-smoking laws came in, people were, you knew all about secondary smoking, it had already become a little bit un- um, unsocial to smoke and people were kind of ready to go that next stage but con um, in contrast when many years before that the rules for you must wear a seat belt and a car came in that was not people didn't like my dad used to just pretend to wear a seat belt and not wear it at all because he hadn't been taken through that process so England at the time wasn't ready for an anti seat belt law um, for a seat belt law because he they just hadn't hadn't realized the, da the dangers and so on so this model is really nice for lots of checking your messaging. So any thoughts, comments, or reflections about this as a tool for communication?
feel free to type anything or uh, or Nat can fill in <laughs> if she has any thoughts as well. Just maybe going back to the ob cat obesity uh, example, what kind of example would a, would a client be if they are maybe on a maintenance phase, but maybe like, like starting to lose motivation? That's a really good question. So, um, yeah, what can you do? So if you recognize that they're, motivate, that they're at maintenance phase and if they're sort of saying that they're worried they might slip down again, um, there's all sorts of things. So things like um, reflecting on success and, and highlighting how, and I think this is something that's very easy to miss. And so if a cat comes in and, you know, that, that they've gone thinner, <laughs> whatever the word is, you know, the person's done really well, it's really important to recognize that and to reward them and to say, what a great job. This is so much better. You know, this is really, um, they're much healthier now. And we often miss that bit out because it's not a problem anymore. And so that idea of nurturing and coaching and supporting um, is really important to keep that maintenance phase going or also just asking and saying well well done you've you know your cat's lost some weight um how are you finding that because if they say oh it's great um and then you'll know that they're quite invested but if they say oh well you know the new food's expensive and i'm thinking about going back to the old food and then you can um give some advice that fits with that with those barriers that they're identifying and that relates to how do you know what stage people are at and this is about that communication. So if you ask nice open questions, um, um, then you'll see people give away quite easily really where they're at because either they're very action-based and they're saying things like I can and I will and I'm doing, um, or if they're not quite there yet, they'll say things like I could do or I might um, and those sorts of words. And if they're just like, you know, not aware of it, um, then that will be quite clear as well. So that comes from nice open questions at the beginning. Yeah. So it's worth, um, you know, if you watch this back again or taking a moment just to start practicing this in, in real life, you know, practice it with your kids or with your husband, see where they are um, and see if you're, what you're asking of them makes sense depending on where they are. I use it with my children all the time. Um, you know, I think, why aren't you doing that? And then I'll be Okay, let's take it back a step and <laughs> where and meet them where they are, where their needs are. And then that's much more uh that, that's the magic of getting people to tidy their rooms up and things like that. Okay, so we'll move on. And important to note is that these stages of change also have an emotional element. And so as people go through change, there's you know, it's a roller coaster. So you start off being really motivated and positive. But you might come across anxiety or fear or defensiveness. And as vets and people, you know, facing clients, um, it's important to keep a little bit separate from that. It's very easy to judge people when they're being defensive, but maybe they're actually further along in the process of change than you thought. And they and they and they just need to vocalize um, some things that show that. So recognizing how they're feeling and that it's very valid and that it's part of change can be helpful in supporting them as well. And there's lots of models of this. This is a very, I don't have permission to use the pictures. We did, we did a messy picture, um, but there's lots of very similar versions. So there's some more top tips of kind of summarizing what we've done so far is that knowing something doesn't mean you'll do it. And awareness doesn't always result in behavior change. So when we've we need to just do check-ins in our head all the time in a consultation. So if you're telling someone something and then you're, oh, now they know it, but then reminding yourself that, that might not be enough to make sure they do it. And also a change in attitude doesn't always mean behavior change. So even if you um, presented the case for vaccination, for example, and maybe they're now positive about vaccination, whereas they were very unsure about it before, it still doesn't mean they necessarily do it. And even intentions, I'm sure we can all, all realize this intentions don't always lead to behavior change because we can intend to do things and then not do them um and but we do know that desired behaviors need to be modeled rehearsed and reinforced not just explained so it's about that support and of course as vets we can't support them in their day-to-day -day lives but what could we do to help that how can we get a family to work together to do some of the things we want them to do how can maybe vet nurses support them how can follow-up appointments support them to make sure we're on track and so it's not just about imparting knowledge, changing attitudes or having a plan. Um, we need to go further to enable the changes to happen.
principle two, we're doing a whistle stop tour is about psychology is key in, um, in driving change. And again, psychology, there's so many elements of psychology, you can specialize in all of these things. And a little bit of information about some of these can provide us with some shortcuts to how to make, um, to how to make these work. And it's important to bear in mind as vets, um, we're, we're all scientists, we're quite used to being very rational, logical thinkers, um, just because of the nature of our jobs. So that the world and, and us to a certain degree as well, we still base decisions based on emotions rather than rational thinking. And that if we ignore that emotional weight, then that's at our peril because people aren't as rational, as logical as we think. So how can we do that in reality? Well, we need to be um, trying to match the emotional side. So if someone comes in and they're talking in terms of being worried about their pet and you know, worried about the way that they're scared of an injection or something, we need to be um, addressing that and really addressing their emotional needs as well as just rationalizing it. Um, and that will get you a long way to building that rapport, which will help us to avoid some of the problems that we'll talk about in a minute. And the role of habit is a really interesting one. So, so many things about animal care and animal maintenance, the way we look after our animals are hab habitual. We just do day to day looking after our animals, especially the ones we live with. So um, habits are so powerful and they're also so stronger than intention because we can intend to do something, but then our patterns of behavior kick in and we just do what we've always done. Um, so this can be, you, this can work against us because habits are so strong but also we can use them. And a way of doing that is by hooking things that we want people to do into their routines and their current habits. So physiotherapists are really good at doing this because physiotherapists have traditionally struggled with getting people to follow whole treatment plans. So people are terrible at doing the exercises that they need to do that the physiotherapy requires. And so physiotherapists give advice that says things like every time you sit on the toilet make sure you do your leg exercises or move your knees and that gives a much more much more compliance than if they just say do those exercises three times a day and so in England again we love drinking tea and so they say you know every time you put the kettle on to make a cup of tea then um, you know check your dog or um, when you've every day when you've prepared your breakfast then give the dog their antibiotics or um, or give some enrichment or scatter food on the ground so that they have to be fed in a different way. And if we can tie the behaviors we want people to do with behaviors that they're doing already, that's a really stronger way of embedding those behaviors. And so it can be really worth taking a moment to ask someone how they're about their daily routine and then um, helping them to add on the behavior we want that fits into that routine. And it will work for yourself as well. So maybe after this call or maybe just now, just jot down when I do something, I will do something else. And then reminding of your motivation. So one simple one that really worked for me is I'm really bad. I wear glasses to drive. I come in the house, I lose them and then I can't find them when I want to watch the TV. And so I did this to myself and I said, when I come in the door, I will put my glasses on the um, fireplace so that I don't get annoyed and can't find them when I want to watch TV. And to my surprise, this habit has been lifelong um, of losing my glasses. Um, and it was quite quickly I managed to establish it. And now, yeah, for ages, touch wood, I haven't regressed. Um, so that's one simple example. Um, but we can use these for adding care behaviours to, to animals. So if you think of any examples, and pop them in the chat, um, or we can share them afterwards as well. <laughs> These are very good tips in terms of how you like cues to remind uh, pet owners in terms of things they need to do routinely with their animals. Yeah, so it could be, um, or you can find out. So if it's something that only needs to be done weekly, like maybe brushing an animal so they don't get matted hair, and then ask them what they do weekly, ask them what they do on a Saturday morning, and try to incorporate it into that. Um, the same for monthly or daily, we can start to really tie it, tie it in. Okay, we'll continue. We can always come back to some of these in the Q&A. 
So something we want to avoid is some cognitive biases. So for example, confirmation bias is key from the point of view our clients have beliefs. So confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values. So in English, that is that if somebody, for example, if somebody's anti-vaccination and they don't believe in vaccination, they're more likely to take on information that backs that up. They're more likely to believe the horror story about when vaccinations go wrong. And they're more likely to listen to people who believe the same as they do than they are if you go from a scientific point of view about why you should consider vaccination. And so with that sort of person, that sort of client, you need to be a little bit careful because if you go in with a heavy, you know, this is why you should get vaccinated, they are not going to, the possibility or the likelihood is, is that they won't take that information on because it's not in their belief system. So what we need to be a little bit, it sounds sneaky, and this is where the ethics of behaviour change gets really interesting. But what we can do to avoid that is by focusing on the things we, were in, we, we, are, we share with the clients. So we have our beliefs. Um, so in this picture, we've got our beliefs and then facts and new information. And what we take on is where they both join up. So what do we can do when we're worrying about, we wonder if we're just going to get ignored by people, is that we can think about what their values are. So if they are very, they very clearly love their animal, they identify as being a responsible owner, um, they don't want their animal to get a disease, they, um, they, they believe that they make decisions based on evidence, for example, then we can if we can come and come at it from that place and then say, if you believe all these things, this behavior joins up with all those things. And then you're at less risk, um, less a risk of being put in the rubbish box. <laughs> um, and we'll come to this a bit later, but it's good. These tools, sometimes I have this in my head. I just have like a Venn diagram in my head like this one, whereas the yellow one might say, might be the client and the blue one's us. And we need to find that middle ground where our values are the same and try to stick there. Because if we go just purely into the blue area, that's us, um, and then it won't work. They're not going to take it on. And so it's kind of a tip to sometimes it can be a visual tip in a conversation to kind of be getting information from, from them. And then you realize that they have a really strong belief that counters something you have. Um, but you know they care for the animal and it might help you to frame the way you, you talk about something to be more persuasive um, if you take that into account. Moving on. Um, the, so the environment influences change and this can be a bit of a shortcut. How can we use this piece of information to make change even easier? So we're all affected by the environment. So the picture on the top left, when it's really cold, we put on a jumper and get a hot drink. So we didn't, we might not have done that if it wasn't for our environment making us cold in the first place. Bottom left, we're much more likely to recycle if we have very clear places and we're enabled to do so very easily. We don't have to think about it too much because it's very clear. Um, top right, one for the men. If you provide a target, then you get much cleaner bathrooms. Um, because uh, that's men, men behavior, like, like taking aim. Um, and so that's, that's a very clear way that the environment, we can manipulate things in the environment to change people's behavior. And an animal welfare one, um, lots of work's been done in the slaughter abattoir industry, where if we change the way that animals are led into the killing area, there we can decrease the need for the behavior of handlers in hurting them, hitting them and whipping them towards things because we can make them move more easily. So we know that the environment influences change. How can we use that in the context of our consultations? And this again goes back to that habit thing. So just to underline this, if we can find prompts and triggers and hooks in the environment, not just in our behaviors, and then this can help as well. So it might be that you leave a message on the door or that you, um, you know, use things already in the environment to, to change people's behaviors. One that's interesting, isn't it? So sometimes people say that if you want to remember something, leave it by the door and you won't be able to go out the door, you'll go past it and you'll remember to pick it up. 
So that works for some people. It doesn't work for me. I have a very good way of just ignoring what's by the door, walking over it, you know, picking up and putting it somewhere else to get it out of my way. And it doesn't change my behavior of taking it with me. So sometimes that doesn't work. But for some people, it does. Isn't that got an example? <laughs> I, I find hanging it with your house keys works better than sticking notes on the door. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And so to ask people what works for you, you know, to say, are you the sort of person who likes, who takes notice of notes? Are you the sort of person who, you know, who likes hanging it on your door key or with your glasses? Because if you need glasses, that can be a good place to hook it on. You know, so this goes back to things like where are you going to put your the medications to remind you to take it? Obviously, you have to be safe, but where, how, you know, what in the environment can we use to provide triggers to get you to do the thing we want you to do? Um, so, and, and also, I think sometimes, like, uh, if you get too used to it, it's not a trigger anymore. So you kind of need to create new ones for yourself as well. Definitely, it's a bit like enrichment. So what's enriching for one, you know, one day something's enrichment, but it doesn't mean that just having a ball in the cage is going to be, you know, exciting forever. So it's the same for animals. Um, moving on to principle four is that change must be owned. So this is um, kind of relevant to the saying, tell me and I forget, show me and I remember, involve me and I truly understand. So again, I think we've all kind of experienced this. Um, if we're told things, it's easy to forget them. Being shown is, is good, but it's not as good as doing it yourself. And as vets, this is a really key one. And so vets are so good generally, and they have all the tips of giving cats tablets, for example, or giving dogs medication um, or changing a bandage. But this can be, because it's so second nature to vets, um, it's easy to forget that some people really struggle with it. And so... Um, Especially, I think this is why lots of antibiotic courses, they don't go through the whole course because people do it when they really have to, but it's a big struggle and the cat's wisened up and now they know that they've got the food in it and they eat all the food and spit it out and all that kind of thing. So um, it's really important to try to help the client practice what you want them to do in the safety of the consultation. So even if it's with a placebo, you know, uh, something else that's not a tablet, um, you know, help show them how to hold the animal, show them how to... Uh, show them your techniques because it's a really big deal. It can be quite worrying for someone to um, to be told to do some of these things, especially with dogs that might bite, you know, um, and if they don't have the muzzle or, or things like that. I think it's a good thing just to bear in your mind every time you give a piece of advice or you're asking someone to do something, ask yourself, am I just telling them or can I show them and can I involve them in practicing this in a safe spot? Because also we know that when people have, um, oh, it's on the next slide. Um, so, oops, right, so I'll come to it. Um, because um, as a, President Obama once said, I'm asking you to believe not in my ability to create change, but in yours. It's not good enough that they know that you can give a cat a tablet if they can't give a cat a tablet. It doesn't help. Um, so, this is the one I wanted, because um, there's a theory of self-efficacy, which is that we're more likely to repeat what we're good at. So we're more likely to try again if we've been successful in a safe environment. Um, and it's a task-based version of self-esteem. And so things like, um, you know, rebandaging if someone's got to change a uh, dressing, that's another example of something that vets make look very easy and isn't so easy for people to do. So putting it on and then taking it off and saying, now you do it, or you know, now the vet nurse will come in and help you to do that. It can be so, so valuable and literally make a difference to whether that's likely to be done at home in the frequency that needs to be done in. Um, so this, the tip is to, every time you give an instruction, try to work out how you could also show them and also involve the person. And that involvement also includes things like um, ask what we said before about the triggers, asking them about in the day, um, what habits can we um, add to the behavior we want onto it? Any other examples of, I've given the example of giving tablets and of changing dressings. Anything else that anyone can think of? Um, also, like not, not new examples, but uh, this is the part where I feel like getting your veterinary team, your veterinary practice teams involved is 
is very useful. So you don't take up just the vet's time in showing the clients, but you have your vet nurses, uh, you have your your other staff that are good with animals, and and they themselves can also show what they have learned in terms of and tips of, you know, how to peel your cats, for example, uh, or, or what kind of tips uh, uh, they can talk to their clients. Because vets, you know, we we some some of us are very trained, and we don't think twice about giving tablets to cats anymore. But some of your staff might have good tips as well. So it's good to get the whole veterinary practice team involved. That's a really good point. And also, if you've got, you know, sort of outreach element to your vet practice, you could put, you know, little videos online about how to do it. So you can say, this is how you do it. I haven't got time. Maybe you haven't got time to show them, or maybe you do show them. And then say, there's also follow it up. And there's also some videos online with some techniques that our vet nurses have put together. Um, and pop those online or find ones that are already online um, to share because that's quite accessible as well. I think, uh, and it's uh, some of the tips would be useful. For example, uh, if you learn how to transport your cat and dog safely, it's going to be useful to learn that before you even reach the clinic. So, so those kind of videos are very, very helpful. Definitely. Good tip. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment at this point in the presentation and have a little bit of a reflection of what that we've said so far has resonated with you. Is there anything that you think, yes, that makes sense, I want to do it? Hopefully there might be something. Um, or is there any thoughts you've had about how you can apply anything? Um, so if you can share that in the chat, that would be great. Or if you're going to, you know, or later have a reflection because what we want to do it's not just, you know, have a webinar that you watch and then enjoy for that, hopefully enjoy for the duration of the webinar, but be it's useful afterwards. And someone has already popped in chat as well um, that what there's sometimes struggles about the family's involvement. So sometimes, you know, the person that brings in the dog might be compliant and ready to take on what you've said, but sometimes all the family don't. Um, and the recognition that sometimes there's, you know, there's lots of people in the family all having um, different influences on that on the animal, um, and it's key, and obesity is a key one. How can you involve everybody in it? So sometimes empowering people and saying, um, you know, so when you go home, how do you think you'll broach this with your husband? What are you going to say? And then you might be able to help them to formulate their communication with their family a little bit better. Or give them some more tips or again if you've got um, if you're more technically minded put on the in, uh, on your uh, on a video somewhere um, showing the children getting involved or husbands getting involved and, and so on um, and also you might want to like in obesity often we say when the children come home you know children sometimes really like playing with animals they just lack the imagination to know what to do so you could say instead of you know some of the portion of their um, that pet's food for the night, you know, we're going to let the children throw a handful in the grass and the dog has to go and find it in an area, caveats of in an area where there's not, they're not going to get lungworm or anything in that grass. Um, but, you know, to um, to bring the family involved a little bit more in enrichment or in some provisions. That's That's actually a very good example of family members at different stages of change as well. Yeah, so it's quite, that's a really, could be a really significant barrier when, you know, when you've got one person, a child's giving them all their dinner from the table whilst the rest of the people are trying to work on obesity. So again, that's where vet nurses in the UK, vet nurses have an increasingly strong role in the support and kind of creative ideas and coming up with how to get everyone involved. And some an exercise that I know some vet nurses do is go through a day in the life of the dog or cat and say what happens in the day you know the children get up and they might watch tv and then the mum gets up and then this happens and that happens and that can be a way of building other people into the program and saying well your responsibility is at this time of day you can do that or can you try to change your behavior not to do that and to do something else um, so that can be a useful activity Okay, so we'll carry on and maybe have some more reflections at the end. Oh, there's a cat. Have a stretch. <laughs> have a stretch. 
And that's kind of another example of that environmental cue. So I know, you know whenever I see the cat slide, I meant to remind people to have a, have a wiggle. Um, so that's another environmental prompt that's changing my behavior. So now just a few more words on communication. So you can see on the picture on the top right, this is where one person can see an N and the other person can see a U. And you can imagine that if you can see the N, you might give a hundred reasons why it's an N, but if the other person's perspective is that they can see a U, they're going to feel perhaps defensive, they're gonna think you're mad um, or something that's unlikely to resolve unless we think of a way of handling it. And we know that um, from a field called motivational interviewing, which is um, from studying thousands and thousands and thousands of um, people in the human health field, such as people trying to give up alcohol or drugs or cigarettes, um, that confrontation is the biggest failure of predictor, the failure to change. So it sometimes works, you know, people say you shouldn't do that and people change, but most often than not, it's going to um, have the opposite effect. So we need to be really careful. We're not setting up that kind of confronting people and um, forcing them to see them, that they're wrong or that their behavior is affecting the animal in an adverse way. But the conversely, we know that an empathetic approach is the biggest predictor of success of change. And even more than the kind of uh, skill of the person was the empathy of the person in lots of um, client practitioner exchanges, even if the practitioner wasn't so experienced, if they could show good empathy, then they created a much better rapport and it was the biggest predictor of success of change. And again, how to do that, it goes back to those values-based communications. So find out where you're, what's really important to the person you're talking to and try to match that with what you're saying. Try to build on that and frame your the things you want them to do, frame it so that it fits with what their values are. Um, and reflections in terms of reflecting and questioning. So it's really helpful in a, com in a conversation to check in with people and say um, things like, I'm hearing that you find it really difficult to do this, but you do understand that we need to change this behavior. And just kind of reflecting their behavior back at them can, has two advantages. One is that it can, when they're talking a lot and it's all and this and that and this, it can narrow it down and, and package it up in a way that people can um, feel is important to them and that they recognize. Um, and the other is that you're helping them to you know, build that rapport because they feel listened to. And so reflections or reflective questioning and reflections and summarizing things is a really good tool in a consultation and I do recognize that consultations with clients are often really short you know 15 minutes um, and this is the beauty of motivational interviewing because this is the same with in the human world and it's all about how doctors um, and practitioners work in very short time frames and some of these techniques are like short sharp um, shortcuts in how to build rapport and reflecting things back makes the person feel heard and if they feel heard and understood, they're more likely to do what you want to. So reflections in terms of, I understand that you want this and I'm hearing from you that you're struggling, struggling with that. So let's work out how to sort this problem out. Um, the writing reflex is um, again, a term for motivational interviewing, but it means that we have such, as humans, we have such a strong desire to sort things out and to solve problems. It's so easy for us that someone comes with a problem and we provide them with loads of solutions. But again, it's, it's pretty well known that if we just provide people with solutions, it's unlikely to be effective as change as if they come up with it or much more involved themselves. So it goes back to that involvement element. Um, we need to stop trying to give solutions and to make it more interactive by saying things like, um, uh, instead of saying you should do this, by saying, well, let's have a think about your day, how can we do it, just so it feels a bit more co-created, um, then they're more likely to take it on board. I think we can we can use the obesity example there. Mm -hmm. It's easy to tell people, it's like less feeding, more exercise. Okay, go home and, and do it rather than to explore when to exercise, how to exercise, 
when to feed, how to feed, and how to decrease the feed as well. And ask them and say, which is easiest for you? You know, there's these, I can come up with some suggestions, but which one's going to fit with you? And get them that power, power and that ownership to match it. And that example that Nat said really nicely leads on to my next slide by thinking about the communication phrases we say. So instead of saying things like they need more exercise or feed them less, or even twice a day, it's a bit more specific, but it's not linked to behaviours. It's not as clear as it could be. Or things like she'll be tired when this happens or cool if things don't improve. We can be much more specific and helpful. Um, so we can say every time you do something, do something else. Um, you know, if it's providing, I, I, I sometimes use, I do lots of work with horses. So it's about owners remembering to take things with them. This happens quite a lot. So take, taking things with them. So um, give them some really helpful advice. Um, instead of feeding less, say, you know, you should be using this much this cup and instead of feeding it from a bowl maybe scatter feed it over a wider area so it's going to take them longer to eat it and things like that and there might be some equipment that's involved um, there might be I don't know a slow feeder or a muzzle or something else um, so advising them about it or having them there that they can borrow or buy um, is also really helps it will have a shortcut and so it's easy to come by one of the things that I, I got feedback that's really, really useful, and this is like the free measuring cup that's provided by pet food suppliers. A lot of people didn't know what a cup of food actually looks like, the, the right amount of it. So they used whatever cup it is at home. But just providing that, uh, I had feedback that it was very, very helpful. Yeah, so that's kind of an environmental cue that provides a real enabling thing because it enables you to not have to think about it or measure it or anything like that you've just got a very visual uh, thing that always lives in the food food bag um so i just wanted to think a little bit more about our interpersonal skills so if you take a moment with your trusty pen and paper to think about your favorite teacher someone who you really liked at school or at university and think about why they were your favorite and how they make you feel. So for me, my favorite teacher is my chemistry teacher because he was a little bit crazy um, and, and fun and he just really brought things to life. So he made us feel motivated even though I really didn't like chemistry. Um, it was always fun because he'd use lots of anecdotes and he'd try to explain reactions by taking pens apart and throwing them around and things like that. So who, well, who was it for you? It was my English language teacher for me. Uh, it wasn't like look at literature and just read books. Uh, she made us write journals. So it, it actually helps us with our writing and with our thinking. And, and it's, it's exploring more than just uh, English language itself. And, yeah. she always, and she's very funny. That, that helps a lot as well. <laughs> And then on the same note, think of someone who greatly inspires you. It might be someone a little bit different, but think about why they inspire you. If you sort of see someone and think, I want to be a bit more like that, um, what is it and how do they make you feel? Could be a famous person or anyone really. Well, Suzanne Rogers is, is inspiring me. <laughs> I mean, she. I, I believe that you not only talk about uh, human behavior change, but you actually now you know form your own organization. You are actually doing a lot of of educational programs. You're helping lots of uh, other organizations to incorporate more of these elements. So that's that's very inspiring for me. And we are grateful to have you here to share your knowledge. I'll pay you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. That's brilliant. So I think that it's nice to reflect on these things because, again, it shows that sometimes it's not about the topic. So your favourite teacher, it might not have been about the topic that excited you. Maybe it wasn't, it may, a little bit it was, I'm sure, but it probably wasn't all about the knowledge. It was more about the way that people delivered it, the, how they made you feel, if they made you included, if it made learning a nice experience. And ultimately, when we're trying to create that rapport and get people to do things for their animals, that's what we need people to think about us as, as you know, or, or as, as vets. Um, we need people to think, yeah, I want to. I'm going to do that because I like the person. I'm, um, you know, they made me feel like I can do this. They made me feel confident, like it's the right thing to do, and they gave me the tools to do it. 
So sometimes I think it's just helpful to have these reflections about your own behaviour um, and about how you feel because we're trying to make other people feel like that. So that's something you can do when you're having a next daydream as well. Explore it a little bit more. So a few more pitfalls to avoid. How are we doing for time? We're okay for time. Um, so near the end. Um, so just to underline that the, making the wrong assumptions can lead to addressing the wrong behaviour. It's so easy when we're in a rush. So someone comes in, we make some assumptions about why they might not be doing something and we try to provide the solution. But we need to trust, sort of pause ourselves and say, I think that this, maybe this person, this is a barrier for that person. Let's ask them and see and test that assumption. Beware of cognitive biases. So again, focus on using values-based cons. And bear in mind also that we become more committed to what we voice. And so if we let people have too much of a space to explain their situation, and again, anti-vaccination is a good one. If we kind of said, well, tell me what you feel about it. And then they're likely to have quite a lot to say about it. And just the process of saying things can make people even more entrenched in that belief or that behavior. So we need to be a little bit careful about what platform we give people um, they might think that they persuaded you. They might go home and say, I persuaded my rat not to do that. <laughs> you know, we have to be a little bit careful about giving them a platform. So we want them to be heard and feel involved, but not give them a kind of a platform to, uh, to justify why they're not doing what you want them to. And also remembering that things like defensiveness can predict a lack of behavior change. So if you find someone using lots of but words, but this, but that, I can't, um, it won't change. And then you might have to try a little bit harder to make that behavior change. That's like a warning light. Moving a little bit quicker through the last few slides. Um, so if we are dealing with this issue of resistance, um, you know, we basically it's all about the setup. We need to set up the conversation to avoid it by having, uh, by having that empathy, by having building rapport and so on. And this is another example of the um, Venn diagram, so you know, different, different, same. So let's stick at that middle area and really try to um, make it stronger. All those things are the same with us and our clients. A really good um, questioning tool is a scale question. So if you're not sure that someone's going to do what they need to do, you can say a question like, on a, on a scale of one to 10, how likely are you to put into action everything we've discussed today? And this is really telling because if they say, oh, I'm a six, and then that tells you that they're quite likely to do it, which is good. Uh, but, and you can say, you've got two ways of going. You could say, why not a 10? What would make you go a bit higher? But it tends to be better to frame it the other way and say, oh, that's, that six is good. So what, why wasn't it a four or five? You know, why are you quite confident about that? And that's a much more empowering way to frame the question than asking them why it wasn't something higher. So if they're, you know, they're six, seven, eight, nine, 10, that's good. They're likely to do what you want. And you could just maybe say, what would help you to be more likely to do it? Or is there anything else I can do or any other questions you have? If it's a lot further down, there's two ways to go about that. I mean, two, two things to learn from that. So one is, you know, finding out what they need to change. Is it, what's the barrier? Is it that they don't understand? Is it they're worried about something? What is it? And that's one element. But the other element is that idea that it takes responsibility. So if they've admitted to you that they're not actually going to do that thing. They've come to you because their animal's got a problem. Then they admit that they're not going to do what it takes to solve it. We need them to have that realization because then they're blaming, then some of the responsibility is, goes on them rather than saying, oh, the vet couldn't help me and they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't provide anything useful. They've voiced that they're not likely to do what you've said. And that's a really powerful kind of psychological tool to use with people. So I find this question really helpful if you feel the need, you know, if you want to find out how likely they are to do something. Um, and it tends to be quite a gentle way of saying, like, instead of saying, I don't think you're going to do this, are you? <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's quite a gentle way of exploring when you're sensing there might be some resistance. Um, and so the last slide, I think we're getting there, is that as we said before, it's, you know, we've, we've understood the situation, we've worked on a plan for changing. Um, and although obviously we monitor animals' health as vets anyway, um, it's also about helping people to manage it. And as Nat said earlier, something sometimes they need a bit more coaching or they might need some more support. And so I use this dashboard analogy. I'm saying that if you're driving a car, thankfully, 
You don't have to understand what's happening in the engine all the time. So you don't need to know what each piston's doing or however it works. All you need to know is, is a wheel going to fall off? Am I running out of petrol? Is there a big red light that tells me the car's going to blow up? That's all you need to know. Those are the indicators that everything's okay. So in terms of the, you know, you could ask your, especially in longer term things like obesity or some other longer term management problem, you can say to people, you know, how are we going to monitor this? Um, we're going to be looking at these three key areas that we want to be seeing change in. And you can, you know, explain it to them about that. And also this will help them to celebrate success. And so this will help them to recognize when they're doing something right and when it's going well, because sometimes recognizing where you've come from is really important and easy to um, not do and feel that you haven't made enough progress. But also it's about monitoring and evaluating our own performance. So what's on your dashboard in terms of not just the medical outcome, and in terms of what will make you feel that that was a really impactful consultation, that you had the person on board, you had a good rapport with them, you know, how, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about the explanations you used or the way you uh, explained something to people or the way you persuaded them? So keeping a little bit of a record of that kind of stuff, even if it's in your head, can help you to learn from um, changing your approach slightly and working with some of what we've been talking about today. So in a nutshell, the final thing, the take home messages are really, you know, the pleas are to understand first, really try to understand where people are coming from, what their concerns and barriers are, try to avoid making assumptions, focus on empathy, truly involving people, remember that pause in your head, I've just told them an instruction, how can I show them and how can I involve them more, um, understanding that there's lots of factors, it's a systems based approach is needed, trying to address the causes not the symptoms, the important role of habit and hanging things on to, uh, to people's what they do in a day, thinking about the human animal and embracing the complexities. You know, human behavior change isn't easy. If it was, we'd all be, we'd all know how to change each other. <laughs> um, so it's complex, but there are certain useful tools that can help things along. And so, yeah, so into the Q&As, if there are any. Or thoughts and reflections as well. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Suze. Let's let's let me throw you some questions. <laughs> um, so I've mentioned about getting the whole veterinary practice team involved in in implementing some of these principles, not just in the consultation room, but also outside of it and follow up with with the clients. Um, but before we do that, we need to motivate our team as well. So how do we motivate the whole vet practice team? to be on board with these uh, changes? That's a really good question. And I'm sure you're doing much of it already because your team always seem very happy with <laughs> what I see from your output. Um, but it's again, all the same principles. So how can we really involve them to make them feel like a team um, so that it's, they've got control in, you know, and, and power and autonomy of some of the ways that they're doing things? How can they really feel heard? So you're not just creating rules, for example, but you're helping, you know, people, if they create the rules that can really help as well. I remember, um, so I've done some participatory works in different countries and in countries like Cambodia, you start off and you ask people, what rules should we have for this workshop together? And they normally say things like, you know, we should respect each other and not talk when someone else is talking. And then it's really useful because the rules have come from the group. But I remember doing the same thing in a country in South America and I was expecting those kind of answers. But the answer I got was we should leave our guns outside and not be on drugs. <laughs> and I was like, that's a very good point. Because I'd, if I had come in with those rules, with a set of rules, I'd have probably focused on the listening to people and I'd have missed out, you know, don't have a gun in the room, um, which is a really important rule. So, you know, that idea of asking people what the rules are. And so it's owned by the community, whether that's a community of people or community of people who work in the same veterinary surgeons you know that that can, that can be really important and encourage um, and be encourage compliance as well so one top tip is is that kind of element just um, involve people make them feel heard give them a structure creating a culture of questioning and learning from things and that can all go go a long way cool thanks um so a lot of uh vet practice, their pressure is always on reducing the consultation time. But 
a lot of people think that implementing some of these, you know, with, with trying to communicate more with the clients and trying to engage with them with, you know, getting some of the answers out from them, um, how does it affect consultation time? I think, first of all, you're not going to be doing everything. So if you kind of, you know, one one of these tools might help in one consultation. You don't have to use them all. Um, but also there's a false economy sometimes as well of saying, thinking you don't have time to um, take an approach that's more human centred um, can actually not be as helpful in the long run. Because ultimately, if you don't build that rapport, they're less likely to do it. And so you're going to see them back again, which might be good for the bills, but it's not good for um, you know the success and the outcome. And so there's that element of false economy, like what do you need to get out of it and a little bit of time investing in that rapport. And that's where the team come in, actually. So building rapport isn't just about the vet and the clients when you're in that room. But if you have other if you have other staff like um, the receptionist or someone else that helps, you know, they can start that from the very moment they go in the door. Actually, before then, from the moment they phone up or book an appointment online or if they phone up for an appointment, that's when you start building rapport. And that's going to affect the, all everything going forwards. So using some of this on the phone call, you know, hearing how they're worried they are and responding in an empathetic way um, rather than a very matter of fact way, for example, that will um, give you a good foundation. So that means that the time spent in the vet, that vet's consultation can be as effective as possible as well. Um, so I think that yes, if you did everything and you sat them, you know, sat them in a room and uh, really explored everything, that's going to take too long. But we're talking about having these frameworks in your head so that you can think, oh, you know, am I doing this right? Is that the most effective way? Am, are they leaving? Have I done everything to make them leave this room in a way that's going to get them to do what I want them to do? Um, and ultimately, a little bit of investing early on is going to be beneficial. Yeah. And, and I find like like good compliant clients will help to actually promote your clinic to their friends and to their family as well. So if you invest a little bit of time in that beginning to establish that rapport, they can they are your marketing strategy as well, isn't it? Definitely. And I remember a course that we did together actually a, a while ago, and we asked lots of people why they might not go to vets. What were the barriers of taking your dog or or, or an animal to the vets? And when we and we ask the vets the same thing, why do you think, what are the barriers that you think are why people don't take their dogs to you? And the vets often said money, you know, we, they, they don't like what we charge and things like that. And that did come up in asking the owners why they didn't go. But it was much more than that. It was things like um, they patronise me or I'd have to take my, when I take my cat to the vet, vets, there's loads of dogs around and the dogs all bark at him and I feel it's really stressful. So I don't want to do that. Um, you know, then there's lots more reasons about that relationship with the animal, um, about the relationship with the veterinary staff that came out. It wasn't just about they didn't like paying vet bills. There was many, many more reasons. Mm, like, yeah, I remember that that exercise that we've done. Um, right. So um, earlier on, you mentioned also about have about some clients being very defensive, especially when you try to get them to change their behaviors and, and get them to practice the solutions for their pets. Are there any tips in handling defensive clients? That's a really good question. Um, I'm just looking behind me because there's a really good book that's um, called 101 Defenses. So people can be def defensive in many different ways. And I, I'm sure you can identify with yourself as well. So some people get a little bit angry. Some people get quite sort of teary and upset. Some people speak fast. Some people speak really slowly as if you're an idiot. You know, some, it's, it's, it's really different. So the first thing is to recognize that defensiveness has many different ways of showing. Um, but ultimately, it's a very boring answer, I think, in that it comes back to that values based thing. So if you're really coming from a place of empathy and you're coming from a place that we both want the best for your animal, you know, this is we're aligned coming from the places you're aligned is less likely to trigger that defense. There's a there's a model called transaction analysis, and it's another useful thing I find to have in my head. And that is that when we're having a conversation, we can come at it from a parent state, an adult state or a childlike state. And the other person's doing the same. In your parent state, you're kind of in the telling mode, you're imparting information. In the adult state, you're very logical, rational, calm, you're you're you know on the same level and able to have a sensible conversation. 
and that if you're in the child state then you might be feeling you know a little bit um kind of talked down to you might be feeling defensive you might be feeling a little bit tearful you might be feeling frustrated that you don't understand and so in my head sometimes I'm like oh am I pushing this person into childlike state because if the more you are a parent you're the more likely you are to sort of push someone into acting from their child state this is a bit psychobabble but it's sort of I like it as a model um because I can if I sort of detect that um, maybe they're, they're looking a bit defensive and a bit teary, then you can change that, reverse it by asking questions and then say, well, that, this is the time to stop talking. And then I need to say, how does that sound? Or, um, you know, does that make sense to you? Or, or, or um, you know, how are we doing kind of thing? And that can help bring them back to that level adult to adult. Because when they're both talking at the level stage, adult to adult, then you're not defensive. Then you're just rational and happy in your skin and, and confident uh, communicating and so I think that if you have that in your head and at the same time if they're getting a bit angry and a bit scary um and you and then you can feel yourself being forced into the child state and you're like oh but 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 just I just want you to like me and like your animal um and if you feel yourself sort of having almost that growing panic about a situation then you can go come on you know I'm going to get back into my adult state um normally by question again so you know ask them for a little bit more or ask them to explain it you can explain how you feel things like that um, can help you just get a little bit deep breath back on that so you're you're not you're less likely to trigger that defensiveness that was a very long-winded answer and uh, trying to summarize a, a whole field of psychology in a, in, a, in a minute um but it's just a model i sometimes find useful to have in my head well there's one question that's that's related to that as well so this is uh Suzanne Morgan asking, how do you deal with the situation when a client refuses to believe facts which are affecting the animal's welfare despite all types of persuasion techniques? Yeah, so there are people who just don't believe facts. And that might be because they don't believe, you know, there's a whole movement nowadays, the kind of post-fact world, the post-science world, the backlash against science and um, we're very much in it and in the UK especially we're very much in it because people have lost a lot of trust in our leaders and the way we've dealt with the pandemic as well so it's all very high up and in, in people's thoughts at the moment um in some ways sometimes you know there's two answers one way is to give you more tools and the other way is also just to accept that there will be some people we can't reach and it's not necessarily all about us Maybe they need some time to uh, you know, go away and think about things. Maybe they're just not in a situation where they're going to take in information. And all of that responsibility isn't necessarily on you. Um, and that's a lot to take on. You know, We don't need to take on the world's problems all the time. Having said that, um, again, there's a few things depending on the situation, but you could ask them questions. Um, that are quite open and encourages a little bit more. You could try to find some middle ground. And maybe a maybe there's a compromise. Sometimes there isn't when it's like a, a treatment versus not a treatment. Um, you could give them a bit of space and say, well, you know, let's give it a few days and then we'll have another conversation if you feel that it's just too much for them to take on, or or you can give them things. It helps sometimes to make sure they understand that it's not you that's thinking this, it's there's a wider, a wider thing. So sometimes they just think that's your opinion. Um, and when you can say, um, you know, it's the um, opinion of the veterinary community and lots of owners and, and you detract it, you make it less personal about you, that can really help um, so that they understand that there's a bit of bigger picture um, and really understanding their barrier because, um, you know, there's a lot that comes under that kind of refusing to believe, but what's driving that? Is it fear? Is it that they've had a bad experience where something's gone wrong or there was some kind of really weird freak accident that someone had when they went to a vet that, um, you know, might need putting in perspective. So sometimes exploring things a little bit can help. Um, and then also we've got quite good animal welfare laws in the UK. So you can, if you're wanting to go in a bit more heavy handed, it might help in some situations to say, you know, this is why the law says that there's some basic animal welfare um, rules and frameworks that we have to obey and otherwise you're breaking the law and that might make some people think some people it might make them even more defensive so you have to be a little bit careful um so yeah it's, it's, it is a tricky one so there's two elements one is there's probably more you can try 
the other is give it maybe try to give it a little bit of time or to work out some kind of compromise and if it's and also not taking on your it's not always your responsibility because there's only so many things that you can do mm. I guess sometimes in the first place we can explore in terms of why they, they seek your help in the first place why they why they come and visit the vets why do they need the the vets help and then I think starting from there can also be a useful way to explore that that reason and uh, um, see whether we can implement more solutions. The and also it's extrapolating it. So saying, okay, if we don't do this now, um, you know, what's going to happen? What's, what's going to happen as a result of this? Maybe it's a longer term thing, maybe it's a short term thing, but kind of exploring the, what happens if you do it and what happens if you don't do it. And things aren't black and white. So, you know, often saying that, you know, the advantages of this, but there are some risks and everyone um, handles risks in different ways. I mean, I'm a, you know, quite a science person. I, I understand percentages. And, but when I was pregnant and there's a risk of something happening, even whatever the risk is, it still feels 50-50. It still feels to you like it could happen or it could not happen. It, the risk feels 50-50, even though I completely understand percentages. And I think that that's sometimes you know, for the people that we work with as well, when there's evidence, it still sort of feels yes or no. And people don't always need to believe in all the science facts to change their behaviour, isn't it? And that's where things like, that's why we explore things like the environment. Are there some shortcuts that we can um, manipulate people's behaviour? So there's some really good videos online. For example, um, there was a place, I think it's in Singapore, where no one was putting things in the rubbish chute. Um, so what they did was they made it fun and they put like a, a kind of a rubbish, like literally a chute and you threw it in and then it went somewhere and you could see it go somewhere. And people loved doing that because it's fun. And then they just, you know, no one has to believe in um, in recycling or in throwing rubbish away. No one did it for that. They just wanted to have the fun of putting it in a, in a cool thing. And so sometimes, yeah, as you say, you can shortcut the needing to be on board with it with a, with a clever um, other motivator. Um, okay, I think that wraps up our time uh, for today. Thanks a lot to Suze uh, and wonderful presentation as always. Very inspiring, and so many so many tips here in this this very short presentation here. Um, um, okay, before we move on, uh, before we do the final goodbye, uh, I just want to also do a little bit of a plug. <laughs> for the Wasava's Animal Welfare Guidelines. So you can go to our website on uh, Wasava to download our Animal Welfare Guidelines because we have one whole chapter dedicated on communication tips. So Suze has mentioned about communication and how important it is to talk with your clients and not necessarily just tell them what to do. But how do you actually communicate? So we have a whole chapter dedicated on communication tips which should help as well. Um, so thanks to Suze. Uh, any last last uh, tips, uh, last recommendation? <laughs> no, thank you. Just uh, just embrace it. Just start looking at human behavior and thinking about it, um, about how to change your behavior and other people's, and you'll soon become a bit of a behavior geek, and there's lots out there. So, yeah. Okay, awesome. So before we end, uh, we'd like to thank our Wasawa's Diamond Partner for sponsoring the Animal Wellness and Welfare Community. Uh, and because of that, we get to bring you this webinar here today. So thank you for sticking with us and listening to the presentation. We hope that uh, you have gained lots of knowledge. And of course, you can look back into this, this presentation again in case you miss any parts and play along with the exercises because that helps uh, establish uh, your thoughts, your, your knowledge and your skills to just put it all together. So thanks a lot, Suze, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Masava. <laughs>